Good day. Welcome to Bible Class Topics. We're continuing our study of Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, and today we want to look at chapter 11, verses 2 through 34. Here's the overview of the epistle. We're in the instruction section, which is the longest part of the epistle. Begin in chapter 7 and continues through the middle of chapter 16. We're looking at our seventh topic, problems related to worship. And we begin this uh, study actually today. So we want to look at relative to the women's covering. This was a tradition in the city of Corinth. What should the Christian women do? They're no longer following the idols of Corinth. Should they still wear the head covering? And we want to talk about problems related to the Lord's Supper. Then, in chapter 12, Lord willing, our next lesson will begin the study of the problems related to worship relative to the spiritual gifts that many of the first century Christians possessed. So chapter 11, we'll look at the head covering, letting the Lord's Supper become a common meal. That was a problem. In chapter 12, welding those with diverse gifts into one spiritual body. Chapter 13, the chapter on love, love is the most excellent way. And then chapter 14, some were speaking in foreign languages. It was uh, causing the orderliness of the worship to be bothered. Order, orderliness is needed in public worship, Paul will teach us. And then he will talk about the woman's place in the worship of the Christian church. Well, with no further ado, let's get into our lesson for the day, and we'll take a rather lengthy reading, beginning in verse 2 of chapter 11 through verse 16. I'm reading from the ESV. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made... From man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. The place of the veil in the Middle East in Bible times. Well, the veil covered a woman from head to foot, and only her eyes were visible. It was a sign of inferiority, but it was also protection of a woman's modesty and chastity. Under the Jewish law, the woman was considered greatly inferior to the man. In the synagogue, they were separated from the men, and they did not share in the worship. So this problem 
this problem of whether or not to wear the veil or not wear the veil in the worship arose in the most promiscuous city in the world at that time. Since no other church in the New Testament seems to have this problem, it was probably a matter of local custom and not one throughout the Christian world. In a city like Corinth, to err on the side of modesty would be wise. It has no bearing today on whether men or women need to wear hats in church as it was a matter of custom and not command as we see from verse 16. People generally have problems with these verses and we'll go through those quickly. And the first problem is this prophesying and praying that's going on here is this miraculous or is this just regular people praying in a regular way and is the covering just on the woman's hair as we said the veil of the day in this part of of Greece was generally a long flowing veil and then people want to talk about men with long hair how long is long how short is short then we have to think about what did it mean in Corinth for a woman to have a shaven head what did it mean elsewhere in the Mediterranean world and Paul says they're allowed to draw their own conclusions. Well, if they're allowed to draw their own conclusions, as we read in verses 13, 14, 15, 16, then how can this wearing of the veil be a command for all churches for all time? Then we have to talk about this. This is a situation that occurs in the 21st century as well as in the 1st century. Should men look like men and women look like women? And if we're required to, if women are required to wear a veil and men are to refrain from wearing a hat in worship, are we also required to wash feet and give the holy kiss? Unfortunately, we're not going to answer every single one of these questions today, but we are going to present three great permanent truths that if we follow these in our own time and in our own society with our own social mores of our community then we should be safe and speaking of safe the first of these great permanent truths is it's better to be safe than sorry and, as Paul has already discussed concerning the eating of meats in the previous chapters, we may need to abandon rights that cause someone to stumble. And defying local conventions may have a negative consequence. We see this in our own time when we go into a, a community that has certain conventions, certain ways of doing things, and we go about it in our own way we can get in trouble. We have to be careful when we move into a new community or to a new part of our own country or to a new country. We have to abide by the, the customs of that community as long as they're not customs that are against God's will. It's better to be safe than sorry. And even though Paul is stressing the subordination of women to men in these verses, do you notice that he goes on to stress their essential partnership? The subordination here is so that the partnership might flourish. Paul teaches elsewhere in Galatians 3, verses 28 and 29, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. 
And the third great permanent truth is arguing for argument's sake is wrong. The deliberately contentious man or woman has no place in the worship service. Standing on our principles is required. But provocative arguing is always forbidden. When we try to talk about submission in the 21st century, it, it doesn't go over too well, especially in a country like the United States. But the Bible always teaches us that we have to submit to authority. We must judge our customs and decide if they're in keeping with God's law. Then, we must use these customs to gain converts, not to chase them away. When you think about it, in Western society, what does the veil actually mean? It doesn't mean anything. But still in Middle Eastern societies, even today, the veil does mean something. Are we going to load up on an airplane, fly all of our women and men to a Middle Eastern country and go around defying their social customs? Not if we're expecting to convert anybody to Christ, we're not. Now let's talk about problems related to the Lord's Supper and of course this is basically the rest of the chapter but we'll just read from 17 through 22 to get us started 17 through 22 1 Corinthians 11 but in the following instructions I do not commend you because when you come together it's not for the better but for the worse for in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it's not for the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. The divisiveness that they're having in their meetings on the Lord's Day is voiding what the communion service was all about. The Corinthian church and some others may have had a feast which was called the love feast. From our point of view, it's basically a potluck where each family brought their meal to the place of worship and feasted while waiting for the service to begin. The purpose of the love feast or the agape feast was meant to be handled in a way that the food would be shared with the poor of the congregation. It is apparent from these verses that the richer among the Corinthians had ruined this feast by not sharing in the first place and getting drunk in the meantime. Jude 12 says, These are hidden reefs at your love feast, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead uprooted. These love feasts were being held not under the authority of the scripture, but as something that the congregation had chosen to do, and it wasn't going well. They had divided themselves for the feast into partisan groups holding certain beliefs. Remember the first chapters of this letter where Paul condemned these kind of divisions? Christ's church was the one place in the ancient world where the barriers were down. Slave, free, rich, poor, Jew, Greek, male, female. The common partaking of the Lord's Supper represented these barriers being down in Christ's presence. True churches are sharing churches. 
True Christians cannot bear to have too much while their brothers and sisters have too little. Let's finish our reading in this chapter, verses 22, 23, I should say, through the end. 23, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died, but if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that when you come together it will not be for judgment. About the other things I will give directions when I come. The Lord's Supper, then, is not a common meal. It is a memorial of Christ's body and blood. Since the writing and publishing of the Corinthian letter predates all four of the Gospels, These verses are our earliest record of any of Christ's words. Is it a coincidence then that they relate to the Lord's Supper? This is my body cannot be literal. He spoke the words while he was still in his body. Remember, Jesus handed out the bread, broke the bread, passed it around, said, this is my body. Well, it's not literal. It does stand for his body. But could it mean more than that? Well, to believers, it represents a way into his presence. But to unbelievers, it means nothing at all. The cup represents the price Jesus paid for our sins. It represents his shed blood. Without this sacrifice, there could be no new covenant. What of this eating and drinking in an unworthy manner? Well, first of all, an unworthy manner would be not realizing what the symbol actually means. To have no reverence while partaking of the symbols. To show no love. To have no sense of obligation. And, as Paul points out, not discerning the Lord's body. This could mean those who were being divisive within the church. Those that came to the Lord's Supper holding feelings of hatred, holding feelings of class, bitterness, contempt against others, having no chance of approaching the table worthily. They can't do it. Paul wonders if their problems all stem from their disregard for what the communion really means. We have to remember that an unworthy manner does not equal unworthy. Unworthily does not equal uh, unworthy. All of us are unworthy. We don't deserve the, the blood of the Lamb. But through God's grace and mercy, we can have it. So when Paul is getting on to them here in these verses, he's getting on to them on to, about their attitude, how they're approaching the most solemn thing that a congregation can do together, and that is commune with the Lord through the partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine. I want to say a couple more things about verse 31. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. Well, guess what? If we judged ourselves truly, if everyone judged themselves truly, then the unbelieving would understand that they will be 
eternally condemned. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Well, if we don't approach our salvation through him, we have condemned ourselves. Something else we have to realize is, as Christians, we can fall away and we can be eternally lost. If not, why was Paul even wasting his time chastising any of the churches? There's some food for thought. Thank you so much for studying with me today. I hope that these lessons will inspire you to study further on your own. In a 20-minute lesson, we can't answer everything there is to answer about these chapters of 1 Corinthians, but we can inspire each other to get out our Bibles and look harder and deeper into the things that Christ has left for us to understand and know so that we can apply wisdom and walk in his footsteps day by day. You're helping the channel just by watching this video, but if you would like to help us even more, you could like this video, subscribe to the channel, make a comment, and share a link with your friends, neighbors, and loved ones. Till we meet again, may God bless.